Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining today. If you are a committee member, if you would put your name in the chat so that we know you are here. Um, and we should be getting started here in just a few minutes. And Michael, we are very close to having a quorum. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Also, if you are a committee member who is on the phone, um, if you would unmute and let us know that you are here. As I see, there's at least one person on the phone that has joined. Okay, Michael, we actually have a quorum, so you are good to go. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Sharon. Good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our August MAC meeting. We know we have a number of visitors and several presenters on our agenda for today, so we'll look forward to that discussion. First topic we have on the agenda is to approve our meeting minutes from July. Those were sent out prior to the meeting, and I will entertain a motion to approve those unless anybody has any amendments they'd like to make to the, the minutes. Michael, I'll make a motion to approve the July minutes. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Kim. All right, then we will vote by silence. So we will assume you're supporting of approving the minutes unless you, you vote against them. So we'll just take that uh, motion right now. Anyone opposed to the minutes? Okay, then we will consider the meeting minutes approved and we will move to our second agenda item. Um, is it okay? Do I have ability to share my screen, Sharon? Yes, absolutely, Michael. I'll stop presenting. Okay, let me share this. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Can you see the screen? Okay, great. So in our last meeting, we talked about some of the concerns the committee had about some of the uh, actions on unwinding and discussed having a letter sent to someone and expressing some of those concerns. And so uh, several members of the MAC committee have worked together to put together this draft letter, distributed it to the MAC. Yesterday, we did have it sent out as part of the meeting materials yesterday so that anyone watching the meeting today can see the draft of the letter. So let's see. Yep. So I will just make sure everyone's had a chance to look at that and we can consider taking any changes if people would like to add to it or make uh, modifications. So let's open it up to the MAC committee members now to see if anyone would like to make any changes to the letter. Okay, let's see the queue. All right, Stephanie, you're first. Do you want to speak to your the yes, changes sorry. you'd like to? Thank you. I was on mute, my bad. Um, I just I just wanted to, I realized whenever I was re-reviewing it that I had forgotten to include something about communications and outreach. I don't know how the committee would feel about adding a fourth recommendation about increased public like in mass media communications, um, perhaps including suggestions like holding a press conference at the governor's office or, um, you know, with at least like Tracy Gruber and 
um, you know, Medicaid leadership and things like that. Um, school districts could be like maybe given some more resources and direction on how they can like help spread the word. But, you know, whether we wanted to like kind of give some specific details or not, but just thinking about how many beneficiaries are saying that like they just really don't even feel like snow. And so I think if awareness is that low amongst like actual beneficiaries, then maybe we should also increase um, awareness or some like alternative options that I don't think have been fully utilized. Like social media, just like things that maybe would help to kind of have like a campaign to like help get the word out. Okay. So we can try and work on some language here, or I guess we could have the committee um, approve a potential amendment to include communications with some general recommendations or some specifics. So let me just open that up to other members of the committee and see what your thoughts are about adding communication and whether we should leave it general or offer some specific proposals on that. Any concerns with adding a fourth item on communication? Okay. All right, so we will table that for just a minute as something we need to develop and maybe add to the letter here in just a minute. Okay, next we have uh, Kim Yancey, if you'd like to comment. Uh, so I was just going to say, I think it's a good point about awareness. Um, one thought I had is um, I loved the brevity of the letter. I think it's really powerful. And if we add a lot more content, I think it'll lose some of the strength. So that was just my feedback. All right. So maybe just a, a brief uh, sentence or two in recommendations that would like to see some enhanced communication and not get too specific about all of the proposal is a thought. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have Lisa Heaton. I just wanted to say that I um, I was impressed. Um, I think this is a hard letter to write and I feel like it um, was pretty comprehensive in saying what we want to say and I'm just considering the process. And I think that um, as we look at editing different parts, we could work on this for eternity and um, I think it just does a really good job of the overview saying here's what we see are the problems. And then I think after the letter goes out, we could talk about possible solutions and things like that. Just my, my concern would be the process if we change and then have to send back out and get people's feedback. And um, I think it's important that it go out quickly. And I was impressed at its, it, how comprehensive it was. Okay. So would the committee feel comfortable if I just added a sentence to the letter uh, somewhere that says we'd like to see some improved communication as well, just in, a, in the summary paragraph with the idea that we could add that to the content of the letter and just move forward with that rather than a, a lot of additional back and forth on the letter. Does that feel comfortable to you, Stephanie? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I didn't want it to delay at all. I just yeah. see if we could. I just want to make sure something, okay. something was in there to just encourage it. So one okay. sentence is fine. Very good. Hey, Michael, this is Brian. Uh, yes. Do you do you need a motion to approve that and to approve the letter overall? Well, yes. When I think we've had all of the discussion, we are at. We we will be wanting to do that. So I think. If we've taken all the concerns, then we'll entertain the motion. But it sounds like you're on the cusp of offering, so I appreciate you doing that. But before we get to that point, let me just ask if there are any other comments or statements people would like to make about the letter. Okay, so Brian, then if you, I will entertain a motion if you'd like to make the motion and include something to the effect of the letter with the idea that we would add a sentence encouraging some additional communications. I think that would speak to what we've discussed. Yeah, that would be great. I, that's that's my motion that we 
that we approve uh, this letter with uh, with your addition on the communication piece. Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Brenton, what did you say? I want to second that. Second the motion, okay, thank you. All right, and on this particular one, we are prepared to do a roll call vote on the letter rather than our votes on the minutes. So Stephanie is prepared to go through and ask for each member of the committee to vote on the on the letter. So Sharon, if you would you would start that, please. Okay, and I have included if the vote to the A or nay with the amendment for item number four. So I did write that on here, Michael. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so do we have Dr. Baird? Gina Tuttle. Stephanie Burdick. Yay. Brian Munson. Yes. Michael Jensen. And then I did get an email from Alan Ormsby saying he's going to be late to the meeting, but he did accept it. However, he did not hear about the, adding the Fourth Amendment. So, Michael, I don't know if that can still be accepted as a yay for Alan. Um, Kimberly Danzi? Yay. Lisa Heaton? Yes. Rachel Craig? Yes. Davis Moore? Yes. Cassidy Matthew? Dr. Brenton? Yes. Carlos Flores? Yes. Kayleen Kenny? Yay. Jennifer Marchant? Yes. Joey Hanna? Michael Hills? Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so seeing all present having voted yay and acknowledging that Alan voted to support the letter without knowing the amendment, uh, we will touch base with him when he joins the meeting just to make sure that doesn't change his opinion. But as of this time we will consider the letter adopted unanimously by the members of the committee. Thank you, Sharon, for facilitating that vote in an orderly fashion. Okay, next we have the Medicaid eligibility update and Brian Roach will be giving that to us. Thank you, everyone. I will present. So August represents our sixth month of unwinding. Uh, the enrollment we have showing for July 2023 is at 454,136. Starting unwinding in April, we had an enrollment of 536,301. At the end of July, we experienced approximately 29,000 closures. And we are presenting in the next presentation some course corrections to address data quality and eligibility accuracy. We do have a data dashboard on our website that we uh, is available to each and every one of you at medicaid.utah.gov slash unwinding that has more in-depth 
data metrics. And it was recently updated on August 8th, 2023. At the same time, we produce CMS reports that do a subset of enrollment. They show review outcomes for individuals who are due for renewal in the month. And what we saw in our six CMS reports submitted at the beginning of August was that 11,384 members stayed with Medicaid and CHIP. The majority of those were completed via ex parte. 253 individuals were determined ineligible and transferred to the marketplace and 16,418 were closed for paperwork issues. There are some data issues that we are going to discuss again as it comes out, including the fact that we are finding that some amount of those reportings include individuals that did have a determination. Some individuals that we are classifying as procedural, procedural right now really are not procedural, but we will get into that detail in a little bit. A reminder that when we talk about closures, a big piece of the closures was nearly 16,000 of the COVID un only uninsured group. That was a benefit category that only covered COVID related testing, treatment and vaccine. So any number that you see about closures includes about 16,000 of that very, very limited benefit plan. As far as the case review status, on July 22nd, PWS started the ex parte tasks for September reviews that would grant October benefits. And likewise, on August 22nd, we'll begin the ex parte tasks for uh, October reviews that would grant November benefits. At this point, I will transition to the next item on the agenda, which would be um, our flexibilities uh, conversation and co course corrections. Unless Let's we hold have on questions. that first, Brian, yes. and see if we have any questions on the report. It sounds like, looks like sure. Stephanie's got a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a few questions. Um, we happen to know how many closures were sent out on July 21st compared to how many actually closed on July 31st? Uh, I do not have that data, no. One thing just to, well, yeah, do you have a follow-up No, go question? ahead. All right, go ahead, Brian. One thing that has become apparent as we've done some data deep dive is that some closures that we found represent individuals that transfer programs. So an individual may close one program and open another program. In our eligibility system, Medicaid is multiple programs. And so that is another thing that we'll be addressing later on in some data corrections that our closure numbers do not represent everyone that lost benefits. So that, that is one thing to reflect and we'll speak about in greater detail later. Okay, um, does DWS, do they have that information about how many closure notices are sent out on July 21st? Because they, they're sending them out 10 days early. I'm just curious about the relationship between like the closure notices sent out 10 days early and then how many of those are actually like closing um, on the 31st versus how many are that like, it like makes someone finish the process as they've said. So I'm just curious if we have. So Brian, this is uh, Kevin uh, from DWS. So it's a good question, question Stephanie. So uh, we are required to give 10 day notice to individuals who are going to close. And so some of that could be an individual that has simply not provided any documentation and then they'll auto generate a notice that says, hey, your case is going to close. And Stephanie's correct. That does tend to generate some activity to, to have individuals uh, return the paperwork that has not been provided. Another reason why it could be is the paperwork could have been pro provided maybe a day or two before that 10 day notice and we have not been able to work it prior to the notice going out. So I think you will find circumstances where a closure notice is going out uh, and then the case is reopening. Either we have now had time to get to the paperwork or they have since provided it as a result of the closure notice. Okay, 
but as far as specifically, I don't have that today, Stephanie, for sure. Mm -hmm. Do we happen to have data that I asked last month for um, how many are in the middle of verifications versus how many have just like not responded to anything at all? No, I think that that's going to be incredibly difficult to get because the closure reason is the same. It's an incomplete uh, review. And so the, I think the only way to get to that would be individually looking at individual cases. Uh, and so I think that that data request is difficult. What we do know is, uh, and I think that this has been communicated quite a bit, uh, over 30% of people that close actually do get recertified and reopened. Uh, keep in mind that any individual that loses eligibility has 90 days post-closure uh, to complete their paperwork without the need to reapply. So about 30% are doing that. How well, I mean, yeah, I would say that's probably not adequately communicated. So I don't think that's a sufficient like solution, but I, appreciate you saying that. I think that the deep dive, I don't know if you have analysis on how much is the verification versus people not responding at all, but I think that's important uh, to understand like where people are getting stuck. Again, if like enrolling every eligible person is a success and like understanding the failures is going to help us like do better. So like understanding where they're getting stuck is like not an unreasonable request. So hopefully someone can maybe like add that well, to the list because it would be helpful. Brian has mentioned that we uh, did do some reviews, so we can talk about that in the next presentation and see if that provides some helpful context too. Okay, thank you. And then Brian, when you said the COVID closures, how many, like, so can you explain like how many cases that were closed were emergency Medicaid? Because like is COVID Medicaid is kind of like a sub fact of like emergency Medicaid, is that correct or? That, that's not. Uh, it's a good question, Stephanie. It's not exactly correct. COVID was um, a, a very special category that's generally speaking, emergency Medicaid is limited to individuals lacking citizenship and COVID-19 limited coverage was not related to that. It was a very special benefit only eligible during the pandemic and only covered treatment testing for individuals that were not otherwise eligible for Medicaid. So uh, a lot of individuals after getting um, ineligible for Medicaid upon application transferred straight there, even if they had no intention of utilizing that benefit. So that's why we eventually got to 16,000 individuals in April. Um, so 16,000 of the closures represent, are represented from that group. Okay, gotcha. Um, Okay, do we know how many emergency Medicaid cases have any been closed? Uh, I, do, um, I have, Brian, if you don't mind me taking that one, I do know that those were, uh, going. I don't think those have started to unwind yet, uh, but they will start unwinding in the next several months. Uh, and I believe, Dale, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was around 10,000 individuals that are on the emergency Medicaid. And again, keep in mind, those are individuals that don't meet the criteria for Medicaid ongoing, but they have an emergency medical need. And so there's an ability to be able to get that emergency medical assistance for that emergency need. Yeah, last count was about 7,300, Kevin. Okay, 7,300. Okay, so they originally were gonna be placed on the end of the plan. Is that, has is that with you saying that it's gonna start soon, does that mean that the plan has changed? Yes, uh, it does mean the plan has changed. The Department of Workforce Services and the Department of Health and Human Services uh, met with many members of legislative leadership and were asked to unwind uh, faster. And so some of the ways that we have been looking at that is an increased use of what we call um, uh, rolling, or uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Dale, what's it when we use rolling, re oh, rolling reviews. Yeah, rolling reviews. And so a rolling review is when the Medicaid uh, review is due later in the year, but we're currently processing a SNAP recertification. And what we're doing is at the time we, re we review the SNAP certification, if we're able to use that data to simply recertify the Medicaid at the same time, we're pulling that review in a little bit faster. Uh, some of the requests were to unwind by the end of the year. And so one of the things that we tried to do is uh, explain some uh, processes that we could use uh, to get to more cases sooner uh, 
uh, but continue with the full 12 month uh, unwinding process. And so um, that was some of the discussions we had and some of the uh, decisions that were made by legislative leadership uh, in maintaining that 12 month certification period. I, okay, this is where I'm confused because last week when you were asked by Senator Andrag about this, you all said that you were not planning on making it go faster just because some member of the legislature had encouraged you to. So, well, it's, was that it's, it's still it's still the full 12 months. Uh, the the expectation was actually uh, get it done much faster uh, altogether, not simply certain individuals. Uh, but one of the ways that we think that we're able to continue to maintain that 12 month certification uh, was look at that. And understand, keep in mind that the individuals that are on this benefit, uh, it, they're typically not eligible for the Medicaid program. And so it, it is uh, something uh, when we looked at who is most likely ineligible, this is a group that fits in that category. So uh, when you are in negotiations, you do have to make some compromises. Uh, and we think that we tried to get to a good spot to make sure that we could uh, continue with our 12 month plan as committed to with CMS and as communicated here. Uh, but there was uh, certainly some um, discussions to change that plan. And we think that we got to what we attempted to do is a good compromise uh, of meeting uh, both demands. Yeah, I mean, easy for you to say. Uh, you're not the person who's getting kicked off Medicaid. Um, I mean, that's just, I don't understand. Maybe, I don't know if somebody else, under, I mean, I didn't know that like people can just go off the record and, and encourage you guys to change your plan after it went through all of the processes and then you can just change it and they don't have to like, like if they want to make a change to like Medicaid eligibility, why don't they need to pass a bill? I mean, I don't understand, like, am I missing something? Cause I would have thought that they would have like needed to go farther legislatively or legally or something in order to change it. Unless, I mean, I didn't know that bullying was like just the way that people can get what they want. Um, I, I, like, do I misunderstand like that they can just do that I, I, without I, any kind of law change? No, I, I think that we haven't made significant changes to our plan. I've tried my best to kind of describe what happened. Um, and I'm not sure that I can resolve the concern. This is kind of where we're at as a department and uh, as, as state agencies in the unwinding process. So um, that's kind of what happened. Why did, yeah, I mean, I just, okay. I just, why don't, why isn't it more important what happens to beneficiaries than what some um, then like why wasn't that prioritized in this i don't understand that like would they not have needed to collect the vote to pass a bill to like actually change without just like asking you guys behind the scenes to do that i guess i'm just like that's what i'm trying to understand so Again, I think the answer is that the unwinding plan was a, a plan that was submitted by the Department of Workforce, or, or sorry, excuse me, by the Department of Health and Human Services. We haven't varied from that plan. We would have had to submit a new plan if we were going to shorten the time frame. And so we're going to continue to do it with the 12 months, and we are still going to continue to not recertify more than the set population, the one ninth uh, suggested rate. And so uh, it, it didn't vary enough to require a legislative change. And I don't think that it's a fair criticism to say that we don't care about the beneficiaries. We're certainly doing a lot to try and help the beneficiaries. And that's one of the reasons why we've really strongly advocated for the 12 months uh, to be able to not only help with the workload, but uh, address the, um, uh, the beneficiaries and the difficulty of unwinding as well. Okay. You know, I'll let someone else jump in. I just, I don't, this just seems like very frustrating because maybe I, I've attended every single meeting I have been doing this. I've done everything I could possibly do to do this, right? You guys have never told us that. Like you're doing all this crap behind the scenes and like you're not engaging like the actual stakeholders who are out here in the community trying to like help carry y'all's message. And like, it, I, like, it's just, it's a very, I do not agree with that. And I think kicking people off on emergency Medicaid earlier they are some of the most vulnerable people and they're going to have to continually keep redoing the process because they might not be done with their emergency yet. Anyways, this is, I'm sorry to get heated, but this is like very frustrating because I mean, y'all have been working on this for a couple of years and you brought it to us multiple times and we gave feedback at different points and it just feels like, you know, this is just like a very disrespectful way to do it in my opinion. And it, 
So anyway, I'll just I'll go ahead and let someone else go. Thank you, Stephanie and Kevin, for your responses. Next, we have Rachel and then Jennifer. Yeah, so I guess just also I'm frustrated by this too. I understand that you're getting pressure from the legislature, but if they wanted to pass a bill on this, they could have done that during the session. Or alternatively, if they really want to, they can call themselves into special session. I'm frustrated to hear this, and I don't know when this conversation and when these compromises took place. And I also was of the opinion, or not the opinion, but of the understanding that emergency Medicaid was supposed to go last. And that's what I've been communicating to the health center outreach and enrollment staff because they do have quite a few patients on emergency Medicaid. And it's it's frustrating because now they have bad information. So that's my comment. I mean, I get, and I understand the pressure that you all are under, but a meeting with legislative, like with leadership is not, I, I don't, no offense, but I don't think that has the force of law and that's that's frustrating to me. But my questions are, um, are you seeing, and this might be something that you can get back to me on, I don't expect you to crunch numbers right now, but are you seeing any um, like effect on like po possibly mail delays in rural and frontier areas where, um, or even on reservations where people might not be getting their mail every day, um, either not delivered or they have a PO box that is, you know, farther away from their actual physical location. Are you seeing any delays? Just this can be just if you have anything like anecdotal, just to let me know. This is just the health centers serve a lot of rural and frontier patients. So I do just want to see if there's been any delay there. Um, like, you know, that 10 day notice if they're not getting that in time because of mail. Um, and again, you can get back to me on that to crunch numbers. Well, and I think I, I certainly want to allow Jennifer to be able to speak as well. But anecdotally, Rachel, I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard of any delays when it comes to the mailing. And I know this doesn't work for everybody, but we do have a a, a option to go uh, to email notifications with text notifications. And I know that's not available to everybody, yes. but certainly if you're working with individuals that do have that kind of access, it is a way to certainly receive uh, those notices quicker. But uh, anecdotally. Is the yeah. only thing I can say, Rachel's. I haven't okay. heard of that. Okay, that's that's totally fine. I like I said, I just I just wanted to know. And then Jennifer, I I, I assume you could probably add to some of my comments that and maybe speak better to it. Yeah, I'm sorry um, for the late hand raise on this, but I I did want to express to Stephanie specifically your comment, but also to the committee that um, we worked very closely with DWS on. Um, really crafting a response and a strategy to maintain the 12 month um, review cycle. It very much was the center of our concerns that um, the member and the outcome of the member was very important with regard to how we approach this work and accelerating it did not achieve those goals. Um, so I'll let you know that the, the position that we, we, we presented um, and that we were able to maintain was that we would stick with a 12 month plan. Um, as Kevin laid out, there were um, some small shifts in ordering of things um, to accommodate that. Those have not been put in place yet. Those are still in the planning phases, um, but, but that is the approach. And I just wanted to let you know that we very much stood uh, uniformly behind a 12 month timeframe. And just that rolling reviews have been because we do think that actually prevents closures. If we do have a person that's completing their SNAP certification or their TANF certification or their child care certification, recertifying the medical at that time prevents them from needing to do another medical recertification later in the process. So we have started doing those and, and find them to be very effective. Okay, any more questions on this topic of the eligibility update? <clears throat> okay, if not, then I'll just preface our next agenda item a little bit. Item number five, review of CMS unwinding flexibilities and agencies response document. So in our meeting last month, we reviewed a document that went through itemizing all of the CMS proposed flexibilities and what had been adopted. And in many cases, the ones that were not adopted 
Uh, the explanation was the departments recommend not pursuing this. And we asked the departments to come back and give us a little more detail and explanation as to why they hadn't chosen to select some of those. Uh, at the time, we had five of the 23 flexibilities had been adopted. Since our last meeting, I'd been informed that an additional one was adopted to allow the managed care entities, the ACOs, to help individuals complete their applications. As I looked at the meeting materials, it looks like uh, you are claiming seven now later in this document. And as I'm looking at the previous document we reviewed and what you're claiming are the seven, I think we're gonna have some disagreements on what is part of the 23 CMS list. So just as we get to that slide, I, I wanna make sure we're comparing apples to oranges and we're all dealing off of the same uh, materials. And I can drop into the chat the uh, meeting materials from last meeting, as well as the original source document from CMS at what constitutes the 23 flexibilities. So uh, we're gonna have about an hour discussion is what we planned on the agenda. The departments have prepared a slide presentation and we're gonna go through it at our pace slowly asking questions and make sure we are all getting the answers we would like to get out of the presentation. So with that, Jen, Brian, and Kevin are on the docket to start this discussion. So we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you. And just to pause, Stephanie, I think, I'm sorry, Michael, but I think Stephanie had raised her hand quickly. Sorry, thank you, Jen. Um, I just was trying to understand, is this where, if we did have additional questions about who did lose coverage last month, has that time, like, is that not, is that something that can be covered in this next hour, Michael? Or I was trying to figure oh, out between the two where sorry. I should ask those. Yeah, let's, let's just, if that's the question you still have, let's go through that right now, because I think that's kind of more of the, previous agenda item, let's make sure we tie that up and then let's talk about the flexibility strategy. So if you wanna talk about individuals who've lost eligibility and any of those details, let's finish that first. So proceed. I'll, I'll be fast. I guess I'm just looking for additional demographics. How many kids are we talking about? How many people with disabilities? Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure y'all have access to that pretty easily. So I'm hoping it wouldn't be hard for you to share that with us, but it hasn't been in the information. Stephanie, we can highlight some data that we have regarding um, some of the breakdown of the individuals by their category of aid that have moved through. Um, I think we can move through that while we're discussing going through this presentation, if that would be okay. Would that be okay? Yeah. To do it in that sequence? Yeah, thank you. Um, we will touch on the, on. yeah, okay. So I'll just begin. We have a few slides just to kind of set where we are today in our unwinding work. Um, I'm going to hand off to Kevin so he can work through some of the course corrections that we've um, outlined and would like to propose um, to you. And then we're going to move through the flexibilities as well. Um, and then with the context of this, I think we have a slide um, or at least some data that we can speak to around who those individuals are as well as we've been able to take a look at um, through our unwinding activities who's, who's received a, a closure at this point. So I'll start with the, uh, Brian, if you can move to the next slide. The highlight of what we'd look at first is sort of summary of where we are through July of 2023. And I know Brian touched on this data already, but just to summarize the body of work that has been done since unwinding kicked off in March of this year, we've had a total of two, approximately 220,000 um, individuals have been reviewed through July. Um, that is about 40% of our total enrollment. Um, now, to talk about the prioritization of the reviews, I want to comment on something that um, is important for us to understand is that um, all individuals need to be reviewed, who are currently eligible for Medicaid, need to be reviewed over a 12-month time frame. 
there were continuous reviews being conducted. There were some eligibility reviews being conducted during the um, public health emergency and the continuous enrollment period. Of those, in, of those individuals, which was about half of our enrolled population, those individuals were assigned their normal 12-month review month. So in, those, in about half of our population that had received a review during the continuous enrollment period, their 12-month review would happen at their normal 12-month process. The other individuals where we didn't have enough information to complete a review or um, a review was just not conducted, those individuals were the ones that were prioritized um, using the available data sources that we had. And so when we look at the body of work that has been done and presented through the end of July, the 220,000 individuals that were review um, do incorporate all individuals those who were on the 12-month cycle and those who were in the prioritized um, bucketed list who had not been reviewed um, over that period of time. There were 93,000 individuals renewed since we kicked off our um, review process of unwinding and then 127,000 individuals closed. We have mentioned already, but I'll mention again, that while an individual does receive a closure, um, many of those um, do re-enroll. And so 30% of closed cases have been reinstated. There is a 90-day window where an individual has, if their um, eligibility were to end and their case were to close, there is a 90-day window for an individual to resubmit uh, or to provide the requested paperwork um, so that their case can be reviewed and they will be retroactively reinstated with their coverage. And so we are seeing that that 127,000 number has been reduced by about 30% because of the reinstatement in that time frame. Um, the next slide, again, um, talks on, uh, uh, shares with you um, some recent um, interaction we've had with CMS, and we've called this the CMS letter. But I wanted to start first by sharing with you and um, walking through our relationship with CMS as a, as a background. Um, we've established and had approval from CMS on our unwinding plan. We submit monthly reports to CMS. Brian reported that we've now sent six um, reports to CMS on our unwinding activities. We've um, interacted with CMS on a regular basis um, on scheduled larger calls or via email when they have questions. To date, um, CMS has not issued any concerns to us or engaged with us on any matters regarding our unwinding activities. With regard to a letter that was issued last week on August 9th, um, this was something we expected after the um, launch of the National Federal Dashboard that CMS has put up. They've, they've also developed a CMS um, unwinding dashboard that represents all states' data um, and this was put up in July. When this uh, was done, CMS did issue a notice to all states, letting us know that we would be all receiving a letter. Um, so with that, there's a hyperlink in this slide deck to that letter and every state's letter that has been sent. Utah is certainly there. When we receive this letter, it does contain state-specific data uh, referring to May 2023 reports for those states who had begun their unwinding at this time, the letter referenced May 2023. Some states had not begun their unwinding at that point. Most had, but some had not. For states that had, it did reference that data. In the Utah letter um, and in all letters, there were three specific areas of focus that were called out. Um, one was call center operations. The next was procedural terminations, and the third was the MAGI application 
processing time. Again, these were uniform areas of focus for all states. Um, CMS did uh, detail for specific states areas of concern were called out in their state-specific letter for Utah. We did receive two areas of concern um, cited around our call center um, operation operations um, and the data that was reported around call wait time in our May 2023 data. And they also um, had a concern highlighted around our procedural termination. Um, the letter itself did urge states to make course corrections and to adopt flexibilities in order to address areas of concern. CMS did not ask states to um, report back to them, but said that they will follow up with us, with all states, on their corrective action plan or uh, their course corrections, I should say, not corrective action plan, their course correction, um, as well as any additional steps they have taken to address the areas of concern. Um, consequently, this uh, letter did align with certainly a conversation that occurred here in the MAC last month and also the data that we have also been looking at internally and the work that we've been doing holistically to address our overall um, operations and our quality control within our unwinding timeframe. Um, as we move into the next slide and I transition to Kevin, um, what I'd like to say is that um, our approach prior to receiving this letter and certainly um, in, in alignment with the concerns that were addressed in the last MAC meeting is that we, as we've adopted flexibilities early on in this process, we've been evaluating our data um, as we've been you know, pulling our data and then reporting it to CMS and putting it on our own dashboard. And we've been working internally with DHHS and DWS on where we're at. I would say that our philosophy has been to look holistically at our program and the work that we're doing um, and really invest in um, improvements and uh, process changes that will contribute to long lasting changes. They'll certainly address the short term work of unwinding and certainly the areas that you've called out and that CMS has highlighted and certainly we're aware of these areas as well. Um, but certainly we also want to invest in solutions that will last in the long run as well um, to improve the quality of the work that's that's done. So as we transition into our next step um, of looking at specifically our two areas of focus that we would like to share with you today, our proposed areas and the work we'd like to do to address these areas, um, I'd like you to just keep that in mind as we've looked at the flexibilities that have been put forth, but also the data and what it's shared with us, how these can come together to produce um, some positive outcomes for the unwinding activities that are being um, done today, but also the work that will be done long term. So if you could go to the next slide, Brian, I'll transition over to Kevin for this slide. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jan. I, we did want to address this slide really quickly. Uh, just a couple things. So one of the things in coordination with DHHS, DWS uh, pulled a small sample of procedurally closed cases to kind of evaluate, OK, what's going on and see if there are some issues that we need to identify. And I, I do want to emphasize that we did find some things, but I don't think they're going to make massive changes to the numbers. But we certainly still want to let you know and communicate what some of the things we found were. One of the things we did find was there are some data corrections, meaning that we did find some cases that were categorized as procedural closures when in fact they weren't procedural closures, meaning that there was a, a, a case as an example that was closed, moved out of state, when that's actually a closure, not, not a procedural closure. That's a definitive ineligibility. And we also found some cases where it was like a child Medicaid case that had transitioned to CHIP, mm -hmm. but the child Medicaid still closed. And so that was listed as a procedural closure as well. And so, so both of these are favorable in that we it, would, it, it decreases the procedural closure rates. But again, it's not going to change it overly, it's not gonna change it dramatically, we don't believe. 
However, one of the things we are going to do is we're going to look at all types of closures and categorize them better in the data query. And then we're going to rerun historical data and use that moving forward. And so uh, we will try to let you know when we do that and when we're able to do that and what kind of uh, differences in the data that you'll see. Um, if, if you don't mind, Stephanie, I'll, I'll keep going through this and then answer any questions at the end of the slide. Uh, so system corrections, one of the things we did see is there were some minor system issues as well. Uh, one of the things uh, that in some cases, and so one of the things is it's called a due process month. Uh, so if an individual uh, turns in their certification, it triggers a due process month the following month to give a little bit more time uh, to be able to uh, try and recertify that case. And we did find a couple instances where the system didn't work correctly in that instance. It wasn't that they uh, didn't in the end weren't approved, but they should have gotten that due process month to, to try and prevent that closure from occurring. That system or that issue for those rare circumstances was fixed this weekend. So we do believe that that issue is fixed, which is helpful to have that deep dive or uh, sample, small sample study to be able to do that. And then we also identified some worker uh, improvements that could be made in the way that they're processing. And so what we're doing is we're working on some just ongoing continued training to make sure that the workers are processing things correctly anytime we find an issue. Uh, just for some clarification, it says PRT process. Uh, that's what's called the performance review team. And so Department of Workforce Services has a team that is dedicated to editing the accuracy of eligibility decisions, both approvals and closures and denials. Uh, to make sure that the worker did them accurately. And uh, for approvals, they're actually real time. So if an approval occurs, it gets edited and any corrections are made before it actually goes out. Uh, if it is a closure or denial, then it occurs the next day and a worker is required to fix the case and then make those uh, corrections to try and get real feedback or real time feedback or quick feedback so that they uh, apply the policy and the process correctly. That's been part of the process uh, ongoing. It, it does evaluate whether they are successfully meeting their performance. And so they are held accountable to an accuracy expectation and accuracy measure with that. And so we're going to take essentially the findings, some of the issues that we saw here and make sure that the PRT process is around it uh, to support uh, that ongoing training and mentoring uh, to try and get the workers to uh, the best state of making the correct decisions. And then finally, the call wait times and abandonment rates. I, I think some of you are aware of this. I believe it was discussed previously. Certainly, it appears uh, based on some of the language in the letter. Uh, we are working towards ex parte automation. Ex parte is, is an attempt to recertify a application without engaging the, the enrollee at all. And uh, right now, that's uh, more of a manual process. And we are looking at a ways to be able to automate some of that. I think that ex parte automation is a, it's ex an excellent move in the right direction. It will take some time uh, to make sure that we get it correctly, but we do think that that will help um, because uh, often uh, the time, uh, the reason people are calling is because of closure. So if we can able to uh, automate some of that, uh, not only will it prevent cases from closing, but uh, potentially, but also free up worker capacity because what is now done manually could be done by the system uh, trying to help us uh, keep uh, up on the work or potentially get to the phones. In July, uh, just so individuals are aware, uh, SNAP, PBT, um, so SNAP is uh, the program formerly known as uh, Food Stamps. Um, and so there is a pandemic related program the last year for the pandemic EBT, and it's for individual or children that were eligible for free or reduced lunch. Uh, they're eligible for a one time SNAP payment of $120 per child. Those all went out in July, and that does generate many phone calls uh, unrelated to the medical unwinding. And so we do think that has contributed some way. But one of the things that we did is we tried to put uh, information in the IVR up front uh, to try and prevent the need for individuals who are receiving SNAP EBT to call. Uh, but it, it, that large issuance to uh, thousands of children does did generate some calls in July. So we, we did have to account for that. One thing that also would be great if you guys have feedback on this, uh, one of the things we did discuss, especially with uh, Stephanie mentioned a little bit more social media. One of the things we talked about is there are some individuals who can navigate the system uh, and maybe they're tripped up on pieces of it and that generates a phone call. We do think a different way to be able to communicate and help people navigate the system would be quick 
video helps. Uh, for example, hey, how do I know when my review is? What if there was a one minute kind of clip where a person could review that? Hey, how do I know what, it, what I'm missing? Or how do I know what my benefit history is? And so we think that it makes sense to kind of ex, uh, start creating those, uh, certainly in an, uh, in, with, with YouTube, there's so many things that are helps to kind of, I can look on YouTube and, and kind of get help to do something. We think that this is certainly a way that a lot of people consume information. And so if you have recommendations of where you're in your experience in helping the, the customer base of, hey, this is really where they get stuck, uh, we do think it makes sense to start looking at some of that to try and help individuals to resolve it in a more self-service when they can instead of having to call in. And then um, some of the pursuit of the additional flexibilities that I believe uh, either Jim or Brian are going to get into the next slide. Uh, but with that, Stephanie, uh, please, if, if you want to ask your question. Thank you. Um, I have a few. Um, so, okay, did you find the data in the other way? So you kind of used like this example of like found some data that maybe makes some of our data look like it wasn't quite as like bad with procedural disenrollment. So how, what about the other way? Did you find any data issues that like went the other direction? I think it is the, the, the other direction stepping would probably worker when a worker should have done different work that led to a closure that shouldn't have led to a closure. That's probably where we saw it. I don't think we saw data that was classified as approved and it wasn't approved. I think it was more that it was classified as a procedural closure. But again, I do need to emphasize, this is not going to change the statistics dramatically. It's, it's simply not, uh, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't fix it. Like if we do know that it's happening, that we should go back and correct it. What is the accuracy rate? So they're going in and they're checking for approvals and denials. What is the accuracy rate and how does that differentiate maybe from like, let's say four or five years ago? Okay, so that's the performance review team. We can get that, but uh, I believe right now it's around 90% accuracy when it comes to the workers, 90 to uh, 91, 92% accuracy rate. And I don't think that we've seen dramatic drops in that, but I'd have to look at that. Uh, but I think that that is fairly stable. And we do do thousands of reviews per um, month. And so we can certainly look at that and provide some of that data if that would be of interest to you. Remember, that is based on the individual worker. So we, we would we, whatever we provide would be a cumulative evaluation of the department. Um, are they called artificially inflated with hold times? So the so call volume went down and um, wait time and abandonment rates did not. So are there some kind of like artificial, like just like, you know, you have like some number behind the scenes that you're just like, we're fine with like a 25 minute at least call wait. Like, is there some kind of like, is there something going on behind that? And also, you know, if there's like a distribution. So where, what is the longest amount of time that like maybe parent or like a, a program type that's like really large? Like what's the largest wait time that you're seeing? Is it, is it accurate that it's two hours? Because that's what I've heard. Uh, it is uh, my guess. I mean, the average wait time is the average wait time. And so there is no, we're not inflating the numbers. We're not changing the numbers. We're simply reporting here is the average wait time. Keep in mind that an individual does not have to wait nearly that long because there is a callback feature. It's simply a matter of being anyone. If there is a long call wait time, they are offered up front an opportunity to hang up and put, be put in a queue. And then what happens is when that call would have been answered by a worker, it'll ring in the workers here and the worker will actually generate the call and they won't lose their place in the queue. Do you, thank um, you. Do you mind answering the question? Is it true that the longest wait time that we're seeing is two hours? I don't know what the longest call wait time is. I know what the average. You don't is. know that? That's not something you all know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I know what the I average mean, call wait time I, is. We could run reports, Stephanie, but I, I believe that that is absolutely possible depending upon the time of the month. Like, the day after an issuance day for SNAP or the day after a holiday, um, depending upon when they call, absolutely, you, it could be. Mm -hmm. Do you know any other government service where we would require someone to wait that long? Again, keep in mind, Stephanie, there is an option to call back. And that is one of the, the, the suggestions of CMS to address call wait times. And so it, mm -hmm. If an individual has, they don't have to wait on the phone for that length of time. 
uh, to be able to get a, an answer. They can simply have the callback feature. And I, I don't mm -hmm. think our, our service they're levels working. are working. I don't they're think working, Kevin. So like you're gonna call them while they're working and they're frontline workers. Like I've heard from members why I get that that works for some people. And when it does, I'm like, great, I'm so glad. But I've also heard why it doesn't. And so I think that like, I do think it's like a little bit dismissive, right? To like recognize that like when, you know, on the previous slide, when it was 30% of people like get re-enrolled, right? Like, but that, I think sometimes like what the numbers that we don't have is like how many people just continually are missing work. They're late to work. They're late back from their lunch break. They're like their kid is late to school. I mean, there's like all of these data points that we don't have. And I think that like, I like, that is what's missing behind some of the numbers. And I, I get that it just feels like it's numbers, but I just, in my experience talking to the individuals, it doesn't feel like it's just numbers. It's like actually like impacting their lives in really tangible ways that makes them trust the government less. But I appreciate where you're coming from. And my last question is just these videos, is this the same video? So I know Jen, you and I met with members and that's something that they brought up a year ago. And my understanding was that, that those videos were going to be uploaded in January. So is this the same video project or is this a different video project? I'm not sure about that video project that you're referencing, Stephanie. So Okay. I I think that I think in the end what we're hoping to do is short clips improvements and then we can certainly use mm -hmm. social media to be able to do that uh to kind of add right that. i was under the impression that would be uploaded in january so i guess um, i believe i believe those are videos i believe those are videos uh related to navigating the new my case product because we rewrote it and um the the look and feel was different so we did upload a video on navigating the new erep customer portal so I do think there are certainly a lot of helps that we have, uh, but we can certainly increase the library uh, uh, and and make sure that they help in the current situation as well. Uh, could I also comment that I think it would be helpful to hear what videos might be helpful, Stephanie? And I think we'd be open, like if there's some key areas for you to provide um, from your perspective, um, working with folks or maybe um, what you're hearing from individuals what are some key areas where this would be helpful? Um, I think we'd love we'd love to have that feedback to help guide us in this process. Um, additionally, I mean, with regard to the call wait time and abandonment rates, this is an area, as you know, that CMS did call out as an area of focus for us to develop a plan around. And I think, you know, we're we're looking at different options on ways to help address and navigate that. I think Kevin put several forth. Um, before you. Um, we'd love to have your feedback if you have other ideas. So I am, am sensitive to the fact that some individuals are working jobs and it is not easy for them to get a call back at a certain time or maybe their work schedule doesn't align. And I want to think through like what the options would be for that type of call and how we could service them in a way. So I think you have a lot of good information that we'd love to hear um, your ideas with regard to the videos, with regard to maybe some call wait time ideas. And we certainly, once our, um, we have more of this put together, we'll certainly present that and share that with you as well. Great. Hey, Lisa, you have a question? Uh, not a question. I did want to speak just anecdotally um, from the perspective of being an agency um, and a provider, um, as we looked at this um, unwinding happen and happening, and what our concerns were, and the massive amounts of people that we've had to to um, educate about this, and um, and we definitely had a lot of worries. I guess I would just say anecdotally, I I'm happy to report um, from my organization and from um, the other treatment centers, mental health and substance abuse that I've talked to. Um, a lot of our fears haven't happened as far as like I haven't heard of people being on the, the phone for two hours. I think sometimes they get confused and those are people that we've had to help more. I, I certainly think that there's always the extremes. Um, I've been really happy to see that it's moved more smoothly than we expected and that, that I worried about having employees and, and clients on the phone for long amounts of time because then they're not in treatment or at work or doing the things they need to do and so just I'm just speaking anecdotally for um, 
from the treatment center perspective, I appreciate that it's worked as well as it has. I didn't expect it to work so smoothly, and I feel like it's getting better every week. Um, and that's just the population that, that, again, it's anecdotally. And I appreciate that, Lisa. And I certainly, I see the comment. I, I, we certainly know that callback's not right for everybody. Uh, and in some situations make it more difficult. And we certainly recognize that uh, our service levels aren't where they need to be. Uh, but again, we are trying to focus on the processing of the work, the, the reason for the phone call and, and our, our timeliness and our day decision is still doing very well. But our call wait times aren't where we want them to be, they're not. And, and I'm not trying to dismiss it or uh, we're just doing uh, what we hope we can do to try and still serve the people, but there's a lot of work flowing through the system right now. And let me just point out, Rachel dropped a comment in the messages saying that she thinks the option to have some folks be able to schedule calls might be helpful. So there's another suggestion um, in, in terms of allowing people to find quicker access to talk to someone. Well, okay. not oh, sorry, my light turned off. Do keep in mind that we do have our various employment centers across the state, and I know that doesn't work for everybody as well if you're working, but we certainly have individuals that can support you at the over 30 employment centers across the state. If anyone needs access to those, there's a map on jobs.utah.gov. We certainly have staff that are very familiar with the process that kind of help can help navigate this. And so we have a lot of avenues to get there. Uh, it's just the most common one used is, is the phone right now. What would be a standard that would be uh, acceptable for you, Kevin? Like, what is your goal? Because I, I just got to say, like, when I'm listening to this, and I've listened to this for five years now, this is the whole reason I got into advocacy was because eligible people like myself were not being enrolled, and it was very difficult to work through the existing processes. Um, the, the, like, whenever I hear, like, okay, they could just do this, they don't have to do this. That mentality, Kevin, is never going to push you to do better because you're always going to believe that somehow the members, the beneficiaries, are responsible for this kind of government bureaucratic nonsense. It is not their responsibility because they are doing the best they can. If you knew these people, I, and I know that I'm sure you've known some of them, but like this is not their responsibility and it cannot be the role of the government that we tell these individuals that they, it, it's just up to you. They must enjoy being on the phone for two hours. They do not. And so like, to me, it's like, if you believe that it's just like, well, they could do this, they could do this, they could do this. I appreciate that you're providing alternatives that they could go through, but the data is what it is. And that is in a system that has all the employment centers and all of that. So like, what standard would need, like, what is your goal? Like, is it like a 27 minute wait? Like, what's the goal? Because even before the unwinding, our data of call wait center times wasn't great. So it's like, what's the, what are, what's the vision of the world that you want to live in for DWS to serve the public better. Well, and and I think Stephanie, and I, you and I have talked about this, and I do appreciate the directness. Um, it, it it can't just be call wait times. It, that's not the only measure to evaluate whether people are getting access to the benefits they need. And I know that I've brought up in the past days to decision. Uh, Utah has one of the greatest rates in days to decision and timeliness of issuance. Uh, we recently had a PERM audit that evaluated the accuracy of Medicaid. The average across the nation is almost a 16% improper payment rate. Utah's going to be under 1%. And so I, I understand that there are some frustrations with this particular measure. And I'm not trying to be dismissive of it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm really not. But you can't look at one measure to evaluate the whole system. There are many measures that are needed to be able to kind of evaluate whether the service or the public is being provided good service. And again, I, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know what answer you're, you're looking for, or you're trying to pin me down on, but it's not where we want it to be for sure, uh, but it, it's where it is now given the amount of unwinding. And, and there's a lot of things flowing through the system. It just It's just the way it is. And we are trying our best to offer those options to be able to navigate it uh, so that the most people can get the support that they need. Uh, and it looks like Carlos I mean, hand raised. But like, yes, and I'm sorry, Carlos, just want, I mean, I'm just trying to get you to say it, Kevin, so that we can understand you are a public servant. I am trying to understand what is your goal as being in a position of leadership of what, how much time and you, that doesn't have to be the only metric. I've never heard members say that like 
the days of decision is like the metric they're interested in, but I could go down a whole list. It's just like, I'm zeroing in on this one because any one that I go in on, Kevin, you, the, the, the response is to blame the member, to blame the individual, to blame the beneficiary and to avoid accountability. And we are never going to make change to improve the system, which like, I'm happy to like literally do anything for, I've done unpaid work for both agencies for five years. So like, I will do the work. Um, but like, you need to be able to like, also like recognize that like, you need to be able to like put something out there of like, this is the goal we're going for. Because if your goal is 30 minutes, then the problem that I see is that you all need to have a better goal. And so I'm trying to understand like, what is the problem? Like, do you like, and it can be, we don't have to zero in on that one, but again, like it's multiple metrics. This has happened and it's been like that for a while. And so I'm just trying to like get underneath that so that we can understand like, what will it take to make progress? Because all of this is surface because we thank heavens we have this data. We've never had this data. My first Mac meeting, we asked for this data. We've never had this kind of data and we do now. And so it's just going to surface issues that have existed long before COVID even hit. And so I think that that's where I'm trying to get at is like, how do we make things better? Because I'll join any meeting. I'll talk about video calls, all five members, but I, I do all of that. And then what are you guys going to do with it? Because some of these things have already been given to y'all. Like they've, they asked for some of these, there's been specific requests that have not been given. The beneficiaries have asked for it. And so it's like also me trying to understand like how much of a good faith partner are you willing to be? Because if you want me to get feedback for you, then I need to know what's going to be done with it. And that means I need to understand the goal of what your division is looking to do. And I can't get at that if it's always going to be blamed back at the member because that's just like, we're always going to have that disagreement then anyways. Go ahead, Carlos. I apologize for taking up time. No, that's fine. I just wanted to to say for general references, even before the pandemic, I was doing application Medicaid applications myself, and I would just call just to check on cases. And this this two hour uh, time frame that we're dealing with now, it's it's not just as a result of the pandemic. That's just generally been uh, the way things have been handled for for, for years. Like I did three years worth of application. Usually, I would say that the, the at least it was a forty-minute wait, you know, and it would range between forty and, and the two hours. So this is now that I manage a team and they do Medicaid applications. It's that's what I usually hear from them: the two-hour wait time. That's that's like a set a set time nowadays. Just just for more references. Okay, thank you, Carlos. I don't know if you want to respond to that, Kevin. Um, okay, so yeah. I was just going to maybe ask my own question in terms of a lot of this seems to be a staffing issue. I mean, if you have a fixed number of staff and you have the infrastructure you have to take the phone calls and you don't have enough staff, then obviously that's going to have a direct result in wait times. I'm just curious if DWS has put in a building block request asking for additional staff to hit your phone line numbers trying to reduce those so that uh, you can try and bring those numbers down if it would be helpful to you to have the mac meeting uh, on the agenda next month talk about staffing levels maybe make a recommendation that you submit a building block request to the governor's budget uh, asking for additional staffing levels or something like that where maybe that would give you some additional resources to work with. I think it's certain, certainly something that we can evaluate, Michael. Uh, I think we always do try to evaluate it, uh, but we also do have to factor in that this is kind of a, a circumstance. And, and so uh, the question is, is it ongoing, is it one time? And so I, I think it gets a little bit difficult given the circumstances. I think that's some of the feedback that we would get that the Medicaid unwinding, we're about six months into it, so. But we're certainly looking at it and uh, keep in mind that it's it's a difficult job. It, it is. Uh, it's difficult. It, it, the programs are incredibly complex. Uh, and so it does take some time. So even if we were to hire people, it would take some time for them to be able to actually contribute to uh, resolving some of the discussions we're having. Yeah. So I appreciate that. And that may not be a solution for the immediacy of the unwinding. But to the point Carlos was raising, it seems like even pre-pandemic people are experiencing 40 plus minute wait times. And maybe that's something we could look at in an upcoming meeting is historical numbers 
of where you're at and what is an acceptable point of targeting. And then we could work with the department, see if we could support a building block request and have people come and speak to what that looks like to try and improve those numbers as a possibility. So I guess we'll just put that out there as something to possibly work on together if you think that would help just even on a longer term basis of addressing call wait times. Okay, thanks, Michael. Okay, um, continuing with the slide presentation, I think we're getting close to the topic at hand that uh, is the actual strategies. So, yes. And I, this yes. is the slide I was having the questions about because in our last meeting, the document, first document I put in the chat up at 2.39 p.m. showed that you had adopted five of the 23 measures. And as I've gone through and looked at them, it's the top two in your first black bulleted area, ex parte renewal for individuals with no income and the AVS, those were two. And then the three in the bottom section, uh, send list to manage care plans, extend the 90 day reconsideration period for MAGI and informal beneficiaries. Those were the five that were cited in the document last month as having been adopted. And then we know since the last meeting that you have got approval for the second, to the last bullet point in the top section, permit managed care plans to provide assistance to enrollees as I've cross-referenced the two schedules. So I think we're at seven. I'll be curious how we got to, I think we're at six. I'll be curious to see how you got to seven. But I think a lot of the items listed on this are not necessarily part of the 23 either. So would be, it would be helpful if you go through and present on these, if you could reference where they are on the other schedule, because for me and my meticulous approach to things, I, I can't line them up. Sure, thank you, Michael. Um, I think uh, there there were a number of ways to present this, um, and if if we want to count them differently, that's certainly fine. Well, we do not think <clears throat> we do not think. Yeah, I the, mean, the specific ask was let's go through the document that we had last week or last month and see why you have chosen not to adopt specific measures. Yeah, absolutely. And that will be part of the presentation. I just want to talk about, like, when it comes to the number, I don't think this is the the number that, you know, measures success for the unwinding period. I we, we brought back to the national average because CMS has published their dashboard of what states have done what it's informative to us to know what other state medicaid agencies are adopting in the process and there's there's a bit of a venn diagram that we have to keep in mind here there are e14 waivers e14 is a section of 1902 we know. Okay. yeah oh yeah i know you michael know it very well some members may not but um, yes, there's there are E14 waivers, and then there are the list of 23 uh, flexibilities, and both are part of a Venn diagram. Some of the 23 flexibilities are not E14 waivers, and some of the E14 waivers were not listed right. on the 23. Yeah. Um, so we we did we we've counted these based on how CMS has counted flexibilities and strategies adopted. But each of the 23 is part of this presentation, and we can get to each of them. So uh, from the top section, there are three of these that were listed um, that were part of the 23 flexibility, Those, that being ex parte for individuals with no income, facilitating renewals for individuals with no asset verification, and then our newest one, which is to permit managed care organizations to uh, complete and submit Medicaid renewal forms. Agreed, yes. 
further down, all of these were part of the 23. Um, and these are some of the, we did not uh, in some hate, and I apologize for, for last meeting, the, they were not categorized as adopted, but in actuality, they were adopted strategies. Um, and some of them came along with the one E14 flexibility to allow uh, managed care organizations to submit uh to to assist enrollees in submitting their medicaid renewal forms so for example um we do send lists to managed care plans for individuals who are due for renewal and who have not yet responded that was part of the closure list that we send um extending the 90-day consideration period for magi populations this has been effective since 2014 it's not an e14 flexibility uh, informing all beneficiaries of their scheduled renew, new, renewal date. We did that at the beginning. We, we send out letters to members informing them of their renewal date, and it continues to be available in my case. Um, using managed care plans to and all available outreach modalities, we consider this to be effective in August with the flexibility we adopted to have managed care assist enrollees. So and then, speak to that one, if you will, because I know you've got the ability formally codified under the supporting enrollees with renewals for submission on having managed care plans help complete the application. But this other one that you're saying, use managed care plans and all available outreach modalities, can you show me where that is on the document I'm referencing? Because I think that might be a strategy in general that is allowed, encouraged, but I don't think it's part of the 23. Um, let me go check. It is on page four of the state strategies to prevent procedural determination. It's number 17. So I don't have them. Oh, on the CMS document? Yes, on the CMS so document. So this is in the middle section, facilitating reinstatement. All right. Okay, so I, I don't see how this one probably wasn't put on your document that you shared with the Mac last month. I'm, well, maybe they're in different order to one, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Yeah, I'm, and this is why I guess I'm a little curious about the presentation method, because one of the things that's difficult for all of us is to track things meeting to meeting and trying to get consistency and presentation of information. And the change of information, so I, I'm going to just, I, I wanna allow the agencies to present the data, but I kind of feel like there's a presentation of information and we're not getting to what we've asked to, to have presented. And we're now 45 minutes into this discussion and we're just barely starting an hour long topic of these flexibilities. And we're not even working off of the same document that we started with last month. So for those of us that don't work on this every day and not everyone is that familiar with all of the details, trying to work off of a document that we've already had reviewed and then to jumble the things up and try and present it this way. I would say for me, as informed as I am about the Medicaid program, it's causing confusion. So I would say for the remainder of the members of the MAC, it's going to be challenging as well. And just as, as I've gone through and looked at this as best I can in the, the time that I've had to prepare for this, 
I, I know on the next couple of slides, we're considering some additional measures, which is encouraging. Uh, there are some that aren't even on the list that were on the previous month's document that just don't have any answer to them. And I can point those out to you. But I, I'll, I'm going to let you finish. But I am just expressing frustration that the specific assignment for the MAC was come back with last month's document and explain why you didn't choose what you had recommended before you weren't planning to adopt and explain why. And this document to me is a bunch of conflated information. We're drawing a conclusion that Utah is above the national average on the measure of adopting the flexibilities. And whether that is or isn't true, I think we can look at the flexibilities as accomplishing an outcome. And we can look at the data from the CMS website on our comparisons to the national average, and I'll plan to do that in a few minutes. But I, I, I just have to uh, repeat or re-emphasize Stephanie's point. For someone who's worked in the agency for 18 years, 10 as the director, and as a Harvard graduate, and still trying to look through this information, it's very confusing in terms of trying to keep it parallel line tracked from one point to the next, just given the time we have to work on this. And when the agencies change their presentation information, change their format, say one thing to one group, say something to another group, you, you can see why that becomes frustrating to different people who are trying to navigate the system in general. And I, I think at the end of the day, aside from all of this, we would like to just say, where can we improve? It looks like there are some opportunities where you've got some additional uh, considerations that you're looking at. And our hope is, yes, we'd like to see some more where we think it makes sense. There are clearly some where it doesn't make sense, and I think that makes sense for us to not pursue those. But the, the frustration level is, is high, and the responsiveness feels like as long as we can put a, a presentation deck together and consume a huge amount of time with proactively presenting the information that we, the agencies, want to present, then we will spend less time actually discussing what the concerns of the committee are and listening to what the committee has to say, how we can actually improve the program and make progress. And that, I think, is an overarching concern. So I'm going to give you five more minutes to kind of work through this. But if you can highlight. Uh, some of the things you're considering doing, and then I, we're going to have questions on the next couple of slides. So please go ahead. Thank you, Michael. I do hear your frustration, and, and I apologize for the distant uh, format. The additional flexibilities being considered that uh, we do want to bring to this forum for consideration. The first one is to renew Medicaid eligibility for individuals with only Title II or others you may know that says Social Security Disability Insurance or FFDI for short, or other stable sources of income like pension income without requiring required data, without checking required data sources. So this is a temporary flexibility, but it does recognize that many individuals with those defined income sources do not frequently change their eligibility this is, we do feel that this is accomplishable. The second one for consideration is to permit the designation of an authorized representative for the purposes of signing an application or renewal form via the telephone without a signed designation from the applicant or beneficiary. Um, essentially, this can uh, allow enrollment of sisters and community partners who are assisting beneficiaries to be the signatory and get a verbal 
uh, approval from the member themselves to assist in completing an enrollment form. We think both of these are beneficial and they are accomplishable. Even though we have to acknowledge that they are temporary authority, they will take trainings, but we don't think that these two would be disruptive or harmful to members. Um, so if you'd like, we could have a discussion about that or we'll hold that to the end after we talk about the flexibilities recommended against not pursuing. Let's pause there and just see if we have any questions on that. I think we are all in favor of adding more ex parte reviews using existing data where it makes sense. And so as you're talking about the Title II, well, if I remember correctly, that one was in the section on increase ex parte renewals. I'm looking at the sheet and scanning through it. And let's see. Yes, I believe it was uh, number six on the sheet. Okay, I have it as, yes, F or on your previous document right at the bottom of the page. There it is. Okay, so last month you had said Utah does not propose to implement this strategy. So now we are considering this being considered. So if we could talk about how strongly you're considering it, what needs to be implemented. Um, temporary authority requires training of staff, but it's an existing feed of data, the Title II. Who has the information is this program? DWS has information on, help, me, help us understand um, for individuals with only Title II and other stable resources that we could do a, a review based on that information. Yeah, so the operational, I, I may uh, require, uh, if I could lean into um, maybe Michelle for a little bit of operational. I mean, I, I think the most important thing to just, we bring this to this forum just to get concurrence and, and agreement that these are helpful, but we are, we are ready to move forward. Okay. And so the, yeah. So I think that's very encouraging and it makes very good sense to use existing data feeds, information sources to do an ex parte review. So does anybody have any comments on, on that one? Okay, and then the second one was in the second section, supporting enrollees with renewals and permit, permit the designation of an authorized representative. Okay, so last month, again, that was a uh, Utah does not propose, propose to implement this strategy. And now we're willing to consider it. So that's encouraging. And what additional thoughts, impacts do you, want us to comment on and how, what's the timeline for implementing some of these? So, uh, good question, Well, this, this is one that uh, we actually went through some level of effort during the pandemic to allow, uh, we worked with our legal authorities to come up with a form that we could use different from the regular designation of an authorized representative. And, and we have something that we think is close to operational. I don't have a specific date, but we, we will work to operationalize it as soon as we can. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, let's go on, thank you. So uh, next, moving on to address the specific request of giving rationale, I uh, apologize, the rationale was not presented at the last meeting, but um, the, we do want to, again, emphasize that the department's priority is to 
lean towards and prefer permanent options that will la long last beyond the unwinding period. So you will see that in some of the messaging and the rationale. Um, the first one to speak about is renewing individuals' eligibility based on financial findings from SNAP and other means-tested programs. We are instead proposing a similar but permanent solution to instead of this, flex, is this temporary flexibility. The permanent solution is to use SNAP and TANF as income sources, changing our verification plan to use those income sources, and it will not be an end-dated flexibility. So that is our plan with that okay. one. So using the data just through a different avenue, longer-term implication, that seems very positive. Again, existing information to do the reviews, I think very encouraging. So I think we would still give you credit for implementing the strategy. It doesn't have to fit in the exact box, but if you're using the TANF and SNAP data, to help renew a Medicaid application, I think that is a great reason why not to adopt the specific strategy, if you will, if we've got an alternate that works better for us long-term. So thank you for that. All right, Carlos and Rachel have their hands up. Looks like Carlos got it first, so we'll start with him and then go to Rachel. All right, maybe Carlos has his hand up from before and didn't pull it down. So, okay, that's what I was going to guess. So, Rachel, let's jump to you. Um, what's the timeline for implementing the SNAP and TANF change or like adding it to the verification plan? Yeah, good question, Rachel. We are just drafting the verification plan right now and we'll work with CMS to submit it. Um, I, I don't yet know how quickly CMS can approve it. Um, and then DWS can operationalize, but we will work it together to make it as soon as, as we can. So I, I know it I, sounds I, duplicative. I'm sorry to cut you off. I, I know it sounds duplicative, but would it be faster to implement the temporary flexibility in the meantime? Because like, we're six months into this process. It's very clear. I thought from the beginning, to be completely honest, and this is on me, I thought you were already doing this. Like when I heard that you were trying to try and maximize ex parte reviews through the plan, I thought that ex parte reviews already included this. So, I mean, honestly, if I had understood that, and again, that's on me, I probably would have brought this up before, before unwinding even happened, because I honestly think it's bonkers not to be doing this already. I'm sorry for using the word bonkers, but it's the only one that really strikes me right now. So I'm just worried that by the time this gets added to the verification plan, unwinding is going to be over, you know? Like this 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 seems like a really big one. Talking to community partners, people that work more with SNAP and TANF than I do, I'm just, I, I worry about the timeline on this one. And I don't know, maybe the temporary one wouldn't be any faster, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it doesn't sound like it's going to be fast. No offense. I appreciate that, Rachel. I I think one challenge we have is there's a cost to training and implementing both in staff time and programming resources, and that does take away from staff time doing things like reviews. And so like the, there is risk in taking a uh, flexibility that requires staff training and then another staff training the following month to train on the different, the different set of flexibilities. So that's a risk that we have to deal with. And, and we, we would recommend against that temporary flexibility followed by another flexibility the next month, which has the potential to degrade the, the quality of eligibility determinations. So, oh. thank you for the comment. Um, so, next, moving on uh, is, is the flexibility to implement express lane eligibility for children. This is a uh, whether it's called a flexibility or not. It's a avenue that has existed long before. Uh, Affordable Care Act, I, I believe it was CHIP Reauthorization Act, many are familiar with this, 
It is a very complicated implementation. Uh, only seven states that we know of have implemented this, it, it, and it's it's much more difficult with integrated systems like our own, uh, which is why we recommend against adopting this. It certainly feels unlikely that it could be adopted during the unwinding period. The next flexibility to talk about is renewing Medicaid eligibility for individuals with income at or below 100% FDL with no data returned on an ex parte basis. Uh, this is referred to as a 100% or low income strategy. Um, it would require additional training and it is temporary. I think one challenge that we are all experiencing and we heard loud and clear last time is that many members have not done renewals in three years. Um, it is the challenge we are all up, up against. And there is inherent risk in adopting a flexibility that would change that three years to four years. This would essentially do that for some members. We asked CMS specifically in a conversation about flexibilities, whether there is any permanent basis for such a, a flexibility like this one. And they did respond that there is not. So any individual that would be renewed using this flexibility has an end date to that, that flexibility and the subsequent renewal, we would not be able to take that flexibility at all. Um, so there's inherent risk to all of us if individuals grow more accustomed to not having to do renewals with DWF, not having to respond to notices or requests for income verification. That's the risk to extending a three-year process into a four-year process by taking flexibilities that are temporary. And so that's... Brian, can you explain why this one is being approached differently than the 0% income? Because that's one you've already adopted. So on the ex parte renewals, so it's the third one in the first section, labeled C in your previous presentation last month, renew Medicaid eligibility for individuals with no income and no data returned on an ex parte basis, zero income strategy. Seems like there's a lot of similarities with the 100% FPL strategy, but if you could just kind of highlight the differences why you think it makes sense for the 0% income and the 100% income, even though that would be well under the poverty threshold for people to qualify. Yeah, certainly, and I seem to have had technical difficulties right now. I might have to rejoin, but uh, I think my audio is coming through. Um, it, it is a much higher FPL. Um, that's the main reason why it's individuals with some earned income as demonstrated um, by, by our income sources. So it's a much higher FPL uh, and that's the main, main reason why it was not uh, recommended. But that's a 40% variance for them to not be eligible. It's like we lost Brian. Okay. Um, oh, we still have you on audio, but we lost your presentation. Yeah, let me rejoin my apologies. I'm sorry, Michael, could you repeat 40%? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you've presented a case where the biggest risk sounds like people becoming lulled into a false sense of staying on the program without having to submit documentation, which seems to kind of have been the approach for the last couple of years, sending them a notice saying, we're not going to collect information that's going to terminate you, so submit it, all of that. but. The, the key question to me being, if we adopt the strategy of 0% income as an ex parte review, and this group is at the 100% poverty level, and the income threshold for 
almost any population now is at least up to 138 percent of the poverty level. I mean, you can put them maybe into a different category if they're lower than that, but in general, their income is going to have to be a 40 percent variance from 100 percent of the FPL for them to be falsely renewed, if you will, inaccurately renewed, and if their income is over 138 percent of the poverty level. So I'm just saying it is a higher income rate, but you're you're looking at a 40 percent variance from this standard for the person to have to be eligible, false, incorrectly determined eligible under this standard. But that's the question. So it is more, it's too close to the income threshold for the agencies to feel good about renewing them because they're within a 40 percent variance of the threshold for eligibility. I don't, I don't know that that's specific. It, it, it's more the temporary nature of it, and and the it is a it is a higher FPL than the zero percent. Um, but that would seem to be one we could consider, though, because if it is temporary in nature, and we're saying to your original point, we can't continue this. We're setting them up to actually have to do a renewal next time. Hopefully, we'll be out of the unwinding by the time that happens. They will be in a better position to access help. We're, we're trying to, in my view, we're trying to survive a flood and help people navigate it as best we can. And if we can help someone who's close uh, be renewed based on information we have, and you can state pretty accurately that they're going to have to have a 40%, if, if they're close to 100% FPL based on what we think we know today, and the risk being we could renew them on an ex parte basis and if their income changed it would have to have gone up by at least 40 percent that we aren't aware of for them to be renewed and actually not eligible to stay on the program but it's a flexibility in terms of where they they might be able to stay on the program until their next renewal and I don't know what the statistics are about that. Maybe we'll we'll ask someone to join us about the probabilities, but but that seems like a, a fairly reasonable one to adopt. So we've got a couple of hands. So let me go there. I guess just Rachel and a hand, a couple of comments as well. So go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, and this one you might want to wait until the end to answer, but I just want to put it out there because we are a little bit low on time and I do just want to make sure it gets asked. Given these changes that are happening, I know that the tribal consultation process happened when the first unwinding plan, when the unwinding plan originally came out. Is that still happening like as like a, like, and I know, I think Jeremy Taylor's on here, so he might actually be able to answer this, but has this been like an ongoing process as you start to see data come in as um, more flexibilities are being considered or not considered. And then, um, you know, some of the changes that Kevin talked about at the beginning to the, so I, I was just wondering, but again, I just wanted to get that out there, but I know it's not on this exact topic, so. Yeah, so, um, well, real quick. So we will consider the suggestions, both Michael, your comments on the, on this and Stephanie uh, in the chat, and then Rachel to your comment about um, presenting to the Indian Health Advisory Board. We do regularly. It is not a, a pre-requirement in order to adopt E14 flexibilities, but monthly we meet with them in order to go over the state of unwinding and and recent events. And Jeremy, if you'd like to add anything. Yeah, I was just going to say, they, they have been engaged with the tribal consultation process via the uh, Utah Indian Health Advisory Board. Um, this is Jeremy Taylor. I'm the tribal health liaison for the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so yeah, they have been engaged, uh, Jeff Nelson, and then um, uh, his, uh, his successor, uh, Michelle uh, Smith have been engaged as well as uh, Brian. Uh, we've been communicating with that process. So, like I said, many of those concerns, like you said, with the rural ones, with that, uh, we're trying to figure out kind of how uh, American Indi American Indian data and those kind of race qualifiers. It's always very hard with American Indian data, so we'll make sure we'll get through this. But we've been in constant communication with many of the tribes and many of the providers. So that's one thing we've been trying to work on uh, is get more education, potentially more educational materials to those rural areas. Uh, working through our office and working with. 
uh, Brian and, and, and his team. Thank you both, I appreciate that. Hey, Davis has a question. You want a, a comment actually. It just seems like this flexibility is kind of low hanging fruit. Um, the problem we're, we're faced with, it seems like in this conversation is training new staff and how long it's gonna to take to implement these, especially the first flexibility with the snap. Where this one, it would probably take some of that pressure off. People wouldn't be calling because we could actually get them approved and get them delayed in having to have that approval until then when he's done. So it just seems like that might be a good one to consider just because it's so easy to implement and it might take some work off. Thank you for the comment, Davis. Okay, on to the fourth one. Let me just ask a quick question, Brian. These pages are titled Flexibilities Not Being Pursued 1, 2, and 3. Is it 1, 2, and 3 in terms of page number or your severity of opposition to adopting them? Like this is light opposition, 2 is medium opposition, and 3, absolutely no, we, we wouldn't implement them. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the former, the, these do page not represent. One. Okay. Yeah, page number one, page number two, three, yes. Okay. So uh, fourth, fourth one uh, is to renew Medicaid eligibility for individuals with stable sources of income or assets when no useful data source is available. Um, this would rely on client attestation of assets and we do think it is uh, worth pointing out that there is an inherent risk to the individual if they are subsequently found ineligible that they could result in an overpayment. This is done without an E14 flexibility, so there is still the risk of uh, being found ineligible with the, the risk of overpayment that goes along with that. Okay, so we don't want to be saddling people with possible liabilities. Great. Okay, so we've got eight minutes and a couple of pages to go. So let's see how fast sure, we're the, get through them. Yeah, the next one is to renew Medicaid eligibility without regard to the asset test for non-MAGI. I, I can go into MAGI if necessary, but beneficiaries who are subject to an asset test. Um, this could have a substantial programming impact and cost to the state. One thing we've noticed is it, it's very rarely exercised by other states, only four states have adopted this. It is difficult to adopt um, and, and costly. The, the next one is to suspend the requirement to apply for other benefits under 42 CFR 435-608. Michael, you did directly ask about this. Um, we have found only 0.1% of beneficiaries have closed for this reason and only one state has adopted this flexibility. We do think this potentially is a disservice to members who don't know that they're eligible for other benefits often and could miss out on those other benefits. So is this more of a renewal angle or a new, because I'm thinking if they've already applied and they're already on the program, they would have already been screened for those programs initially and short of much changing, that I think is part of the reason I'm asking the question. If it's on renew, renewal, presumably they've already been screened for those other programs. And if not much has changed, they may not continue to qualify for them. So that, that's just the thought there of trying to see if that could help facilitate a quick, quicker enrollment. We could see, I I mean, we can consider something. It, there, again, a little bit of adding complexity to the eligibility process and one set of rules for individuals newly applying and a different for people renewing. Uh, it makes training more complicated, um, but we can consider that based on your comments. Um, the third one is to suspend the requirement to cooperate with the agency in establishing the identity of a child's parents and in obtaining medical support. Um, it would require multiple system changes, not only to our eligibility system, but also to our Office of Recovery su support. Um, and, and we recommend against that 
temporary flexibility. The fourth one is to delay procedural to terminate, excuse me, procedural terminations for beneficiaries for one month while the state conducts targeted renewal outreach. We think there is risk of creating a backlog with this flexibility and could potentially overwhelm eligibility workers and result in worse outcomes for members. On the next slide, there, there are two flexibilities noted here that have to do with presumptive eligibility. The first one is to designate the state agency as a qualified entity to make those determinations. And the other is to designate pharmacies, CBOs, and other providers as qualified entities. Adding, if anyone is familiar, some of you are familiar with the level of effort to train and, and bring on board presumptive eligible pre providers that can make individuals presumptively eligible like hospitals. It is not a short or simple process. It requires a lot of training and system changes and, and we do not believe that it's advisable at this stage. The other uh, on here is to reinstate eligibility effective on the individual's prior termination dates for individuals who are disenrolled based on a procedural reason and are subsequently redetermined eligible uh, during the 90-day reconsideration period. To keep in mind, we still have that 90-day reconsideration period. The only thing that this would change, and during that period, we do look at retro months. Um, the, the only thing that this would change is would allow us to disregard uh, income or, or other criteria in those retro months, whereas today we still have that re reconsideration period and we look at retro coverage and their eligibility for those retro periods. So it's a very small, minor nuance there that we don't think serves us to go through the training and programming changes to implement. Okay. Um, and then so you, oh, let me just ask a question here quickly. It looks like on that last one, extend automatic re-enrollment. There's one on this list right after that. Extend the amount of time managed care plans have to conduct outreach to individuals recently terminated for procedural reasons. I don't see that on your list here. Yeah, so again, apologies for re reordering that. That is something that we said we after further thought, we are we do believe that we are doing that. In in the essence that we have never communicated a time deadline for our managed care organizations to perform outreach to members. It is not part of contracts or anything. The CMS listed it on their list of 23. Uh, 23 flexibilities, noting that some states might have to adjust their contracts with managed care organizations in order to allow it. But in our conversations with our ACOs, we have never stated a deadline uh, that they can only contact members within a certain set of time periods. So that is why we moved it to consider it implemented. Okay, but in your July presentation, just again, for those of us tracking this month to month, short of you telling us otherwise, it had shown does not promote, propose to implement the strategy. So this is a, after further review, not only are we implementing it, but we are considering how we've, we've done it before. So it's, it's good. Is that the same? for item K from the original document, renew eligibility if able to do so based on available information and establish a new eligibility period whenever contact is made with hard to reach populations. That's correct. Yeah, okay. the, the, the Kevin walked through earlier the process that they are conducting um, for individuals during their SNAP renewal to to establish a new eligibility period, a certification period at that stage, um, which, which helps us in certain cases so that we don't rely on, we renew when we have them in the office and doing a SNAP review. So upon further review, we do believe that we are implement, we have implemented that and I apologize for 
last month we um, considered it not implemented. Okay. All right. You can imagine why we have so much confusion again to my earlier point, but okay. So thank you for the presentation and for walking us through that. We are at time, so I don't think we have much opportunity for discussion. Uh, given where we're at, I think we'll probably continue the discussion next month. So we make sure we sort through this. We'll figure out what format that looks like. I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Rachel. And anybody opposed to the motion to adjourn? All right, with that, we'll consider ourselves adjourned until the September meeting. Thank you all for your presentations and your participation, and we'll see you next month.